So general relativity is our current theory of gravitational forces and the geometry of space-time. Uh, and this is an important point here. Basically, relativity, general relativity states that the geometry of space-time and gravitational forces is basically the same thing uh, in an appropriate sense. Uh, as our current theory of gravitational forces, it underlines basically most of astrophysics and cosmology today. Um, it is from the point of view of, of modern physics, a purely classical theory. It does not contain any kind of quantum effects. Uh, it's a theory which, uh, in which we won't find any kind of uh, Hamiltonian or, or wave equations or, or uh, states. It's a purely classical theory where the universe is, is at a particular state. And then there is a more or less deterministic evolution of that state. Uh, many physicists find this uh, very frustrating and there has been a, 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 a long quest in physics of finding a relativistic version of general relativity. However, it hasn't been that much successful so far. So at the moment, GR is purely a classical theory of space-time. Uh, it was developed mostly by Albert Einstein um, more than 100 years ago although he was influenced by other people as well. Um, one has to mention David Hilbert, a, a, a well-known German mathematician, and also Marcel Grossman. Uh, I guess we'll talk about that. Um, so gravity is the weakest of all four fundamental interactions we know, electromagnetic, strong, weak, and gravitational. By weakest, we mean simply that if we take a, a standard constituent of matter, let's say two protons, we measure the gravitational force and the electromagnetic force between them. It turns out that it's more or less independent of the, uh, of the distance between them. Uh, the ratio is 10 to minus 30 something. Uh, and this means that on the atomic level, gravity plays basically no role whatsoever. And in fact, gravity is so weak that in our everyday life, it doesn't play any role whatsoever with one exception. And this is the gravity of the whole Earth itself. And here it plays a role only because basically the Earth is very, very heavy compared to everything else. Uh, if you remember your introductory physics courses at school, you rarely consider any kind of gravitational interactions between anything, um, I don't know, a wedge and a ball when you solve a simple problem in physics. Sometimes you consider um, drag with respect to the air. Um, you may consider electromagnetic force or magnetic force if you have a magnet, but gravitational forces are not considered except for the gravity of the earth itself. Uh, gravitational interactions do not have any preferred length or energy scale. They do not happen at certain energies. Um, Moreover, they are so weak that they become significant only if you accumulate really large masses. However, there is one interesting thing going on here. Uh, gravitational interactions, unlike electromagnetic interactions, cannot be screened or, shield, screened or shielded. Uh, meaning, uh, if you accumulate su sufficiently large masses, uh, they will inevitably begin to interact uh, gravitationally Quite, quite, quite strongly. This is not true with electromagnetic uh, interactions simply because opposite charges typically tend to um, tend to attract each other, and it's difficult to build up large charges. Uh, this, these properties uh, are responsible for uh, the most striking property of gravity. I guess it is that it is very weak. However, it is still dominating on the largest scales of the universe we know. Basically, once we enter this, the size of Earth or the size of the solar system, gravity becomes the most important force to consider. Okay. Okay, so let's look at general relativity as a theory and what it looks like, um, let's say, in comparison with the rest of the physics. Uh, how does it fit to the rest of the physics? Uh, so general relativity as a theory of gravity supersedes Newtonian gravity in the sense that it contains it with additional corrections as an appropriate limit. If the masses are small, distances between these masses are also not very large, 
uh, and if the uh, velocities of, of these masses are not very large, it turns out that general relativity predicts pretty much the same behavior as Newtonian gravity plus uh, appropriate corrections. Uh, it also con contains special relativity. So Einstein's theory of, of uh, flat spacetime as another limiting case in a different situation when we can neglect gravity altogether. So in that sense, both of these theories sort of can be obtained as limiting cases of GR. Uh, general relativity gave us a couple of theories um, which are very special, particular to GR. This is first, of, first and foremost, the black hole theory. Even though people thought about black holes before, um, by black holes, I simply mean uh, masses or, or, or bodies which are sufficiently heavy to uh, bend light and not allow any light to escape. The true notion of black hole was invented basically by, uh, during the, uh, only after GR was invented and people tried to investigate uh, the properties of, uh, of solutions corresponding to very heavy bodies. Uh, on top of that, GR predicted the um, uh, emergence of gravitational waves, very special type of, of gravitational interactions, rather unexpected. It turns out that the geometry of the spacetime can be perturbed a little bit by very heavy masses, and and these perturbations uh, propagate with the velocity of light and behave more or less like standard waves and can be detected. Uh, a kind of ripples on the geometry of spacetime itself. Uh, a general relativity predicts that light is affected by gravity the same way massive bodies are. And this leads to another important effect, the gravitational lensing. Uh, namely, uh, masses can, can distort images of background objects, uh, magnify them or demagnify them depending on the geometry. Uh, and this is a phenomenon we observe in, in astronomy quite often on extra galactic scales. And finally, I don't think cosmology, as we know it, would have emerged without general relativity uh, emerging first. Uh, general relativity uh, proposed that this geometry of the spacetime on larger scales is not the naive flat geometry. It can have a very different structure. And fairly quickly, people realized that there exist solutions corresponding to uniform uh, expansion of, of the universe. A uh, detailed study of this uh, of the consequences was was then uh, goes beyond general relativity itself, but I think it's fair to say that cosmology is also a child of relativity. So GR is a part of physics, but it also in, it also influences mathematics and is also influenced by mathematics. So GR is a part can be can be considered a part of mathematical physics. There's a lot of problems in mathematical physics which arise from GR. Uh, General relativity uses partial differential equations, the Einstein equations, as a very important tool. So it influences the partial differential equations theory and also takes a lot of uh, input from, from, uh, from the, the mathematical theory. But the main language of GR is, is differential geometry, or more precisely, uh, pseudo Riemannian geometry. Uh, and here again, uh, General relativity uses this, this branch of differential geometry, but also there's a lot of research in differential geometry, which is uh, very much motivated by uh, various problems arising in general relativity. Okay. Um, are there any questions? No, sir. No, okay, so we can go further. So here I prepared a short history of GR. Um, year by year, more or less. Uh, so it was developed by Einstein in early 20th century, uh, shortly before World War I and during the World War I. Uh, in 1916, Einstein realized that uh, if you consider weak gravitational, uh, if you linearize gravity, gra gra the field equations of, of general relativity around a flat spacetime, so you consider very weak perturbation of gravitational field, you obtain gravitational waves. That was rather surprising. 
And actually, he was not quite sure if this effect is real or, or of any practical significance. Uh, only a year later, uh, a German astronomer named Schwarzschild found the first solution of Albert Einstein's field equations of, of general relativity corresponding to a massive body, or as we later have found out, a black hole. Uh, the theory was accepted uh, by the community fairly early, and Arthur Eddington uh, in 1919 uh, measured for the first time one of the uh, consequences of GR, the, the gravitational light bending of, of light rays by the sun uh, during a total eclipse. Mm. In 1920s to 30s, so, so, so here I focus more on theoretical side. This is the, the, the black um, the black points. Uh, these teal or, or green blue ones are, are more of practical or experimental verifications. Uh, in 1920s to 30s, Alexander Friedman, Georges Lemaitre, and Robertson and Walker discovered solutions um, corresponding to expanding universe. They did it independently, probably don't, not knowing about each other's work. And this seems to be the beginning of the modern theoretical cosmology. Uh, from 1920s to 1950s, uh, physicists and mathematicians started studying very precisely the geometry of the Schwarzschild's black hole. Uh, and it's only around 40s or 50s that they realized that this is actually a black hole. Uh, they realized that, that this is a rather special solution which contains something called an event horizon uh, and slowly discovered all the properties of the solution. And this way, the theory of black holes was born. Uh, already in 20s and 30s, Einstein, but also Eddington and Rudolf Mandel realized that it follows from the Einstein's theory that, a strong, that masses can act literally as lenses for light. Uh, so the idea of gravitational lensing slowly started to develop. Uh, in the 1920s to 1960s, uh, a number of mathematicians and physicists started working on the gravitational waves, uh, trying to extract their properties. They, they, they worked on exact gravitational wave solutions. Uh, and it's a very strange story. It turns out that Einstein Rosen uh, obtained a kind of solution corresponding to propagating waves, but found uh, singularities in the solution and concluded that in fact, gravitational waves don't exist. Then it turned, it took a couple of decades for physicists to actually decide that quite the contrary, gravitational waves do exist. There's nothing wrong with them. Uh, they are real, they can carry energy and they can be created by uh, large masses that was done in the 60s by Troutman, Bondi, Pirani, and Ivor Robinson. Uh, in 1959, there was an important theoretical breakthrough. People managed to uh, formulate Einstein's field equations, ruling the space-time geometry as evolution equations, which is not all that trivial. Uh, starting from the 60s, uh, new tests of general relativity in solar systems started to, to, to emerge. So Pound and, and Repka managed to, to measure a very basic um, prediction of GR, namely the gravitational redshift of uh, and blue shift of photons, a frequency change just because uh, a frequency change of, of light ray simply because the light ray is falling in, in our gravi gravitational field. Uh, Shapiro and Dickey also considered other tests of GR. Um, uh, performed in the uh, in the solar systems. Uh, from the theoretical side, a very important thing happened in 1963. Roy Kerr managed to find a solution corresponding to a spinning black hole, one that is not perfectly spherically symmetric, but has additional spin. Uh, so he was first to derive it, but however, he was also influenced by other people, uh, Ted Newman, Goldberg Sachs, and a few other people. Uh, they had a contribution there as well. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking uh, developed a number of singularity theorems. They basically confirmed that the appearance of singularities or places where uh, general relativity breaks down 
uh, is something that happens in surprisingly many situations. Uh, the emergence of singularity is something people found in the uh, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker cosmological solutions, but also in the Kerr and Schwarzschild case. Uh, the initial thought was maybe that this is an artifact of high symmetry of these solutions, but Penrose and Hawking managed to prove that no, this is a generic feature of gravitational field and GR that this type of singularities develop under certain circumstances. Um, and that was very important. It increased the confidence of, of relativists that black holes are probably real things. Uh, in the 70s, the evidence for uh, an X-ray source uh, called Cygnus X1 being an accreting black hole started to, to, to appear. Uh, another very important discovery was the discovery of the double pulsar, um, basically a, a system made of two pulsars orbiting on a fairly close orbit, and both of which were visible from Earth. Uh, House and Taylor managed to observe quite a lot of things with this system, but one of them was the indirect effect of gravitational waves emission of this system. Namely, it was pretty clear that it was losing energy all the time, as if there was some kind of friction in its motion. And this friction actually was very much consistent with the um, energy loss due to gravitational waves. The, it was important because, it, again, it was a very important observational evidence in favor of the existence of gravitational waves. Uh, from the 70s to 1990s, uh, astronomers found mounting evidence that supermassive black holes actually exist in centers of many galaxies including our Milky Way. Uh, in 79, uh, the first strong gravitational lens was found. So a situation when uh, a big mass between us and a source caused the emergence of two images of a single quasar, one next to the other. And from that time, many other gravitational lenses of, uh, of various geometries were found on the sky. Uh, from the 60s to 80s, uh, Astrophysicists managed to develop a full gravitational lensing theory based on GR, on general relativity. Another very important development, which started from the 1990s and lasted until 2010s, uh, is the emergence of numerical relativity. So, uh, theoretical relativists managed to put the Einstein equations into a computer, uh, express it as a system which can be solved numerically. This is not a simple problem, especially if you if you are dealing with things like black holes, which are causes of large numerical instabilities. Uh, the purpose of this research was exactly to study the uh, mergers and interactions of binary black hole systems and the gravitational waves emission. And this was first done by Franz Pretorius um, in early 2010s. It was important because thanks to this discovery, um, researchers managed to produce uh, waveforms of various types of black hole mergers, which were very important, in fact, crucial in the first detection of gravitational waves. Uh, as you probably remember, the first detection happened in 2015, although the paper, I think, was released on 2016. It was done using um, interferometry. Uh, and in 2017, uh, also a very important discovery, um, the Event Horizon Telescope managed to uh, map the black hole shadow image of, of the galaxy M87. Okay. Mm. Any questions to this part? No. Okay, I don't see any. Uh, I also prepared one more uh, slide, which I find very interesting. This is what I would call the Nobel Prizes in Physics related to GR or distantly related to GR. I think this is an exhaustive list, but I'm not 100% sure. I... So the interesting thing is that even though GR appeared first in 9, uh, 1910s, it wasn't until 1983 that the first um, Nobel Prize for discovery related to GR happened. That was the, um, the theoretical studies of, of physical processes in uh, inside the stars. Uh, so Chanda Sekhar uh, wrote a number of fundamental papers about stars and especially very compact stars. 
And these objects you cannot really understand very well without understanding relative general relativity itself. However, it's not that GR was all that was so that important in, in his research. I think it was mostly about something else, uh, more about the properties of uh, matter under extreme conditions. But GR played some role there as well. Then in 1993, um, House and Taylor obtained the no a Nobel Prize uh, for the discovery of their uh, double pulsar. And the GR and, and, and the Nobel Prize was explicitly given for the uh, discovery of gravitational waves and the study of gravitation. So this is a really first truly GR related Nobel Prize. Uh, 2006, uh, Nobel Prize by Meder, it's moved for discovery of black body form and an, uh, and an anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, this is more a, a Nobel Prize for cosmology, but again, cosmology would not have emerged if not uh, GR first. In 2011, there was a Nobel Prize by, to Saul Permuter, uh, Brian Schmidt, and Adam Rees for the discovery of accelerating expansion of the universe through observation of distant supernova. This is cosmology, but here I think the link with GR is much stronger because it's impossible to interpret the um, images, the, the, the luminosity of distant supernova and their relation to the redshift without understanding GR, general relativity, and light propagation in curved space times. So, this is very much a GR related Nobel Prize. Then, in 2017, um, there was the Nobel Prize for this is a contribution to LIGO detector and observation of gravitational waves, um, pretty obvious one and pretty obviously GR related. Uh, the Nobel Prize to James Peebles for theoretical discoveries in physical cosmology, again, related somewhat indirectly, but a little bit. And then in 2020, Roger Penrose obtained his Nobel Prize for the discovery of black hole formation, is that the this black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. Um, this is obviously GR-related research, and in fact, rather mathematical, mathematical GR-related research. Um, the funny thing is that Nobel Prizes for, for, for GR do not, did not happen until 1983. So almost, it took almost 70 years for the field to mature um, and for the first uh, Nobel Prize to be, to be awarded for GR. And another interesting thing, the decade from 2010 to 2020 was extremely fruitful for GR. There, was, there were four uh, GR-related Nobel Prizes. So people say that 1960s were the golden age of general relativity because of the number of discoveries made at that time. However, it is the 2000 uh, and 2010 uh, decades which are the golden age for Nobel Prizes related to GR. Mm, okay. Uh, so I guess we can go to our topic number one, which is special relativity, a brief summary. I assume that you already had a course on special relativity, so this is more of a refresher. Uh, if you want a more detailed study, uh, I refer you to the Schutz first course in GR or uh, Hartle's gravity. There are very decent introductions there with full derivations as well. Mm. So special relativity posits that the physical ten phenomena, all physical phenomena takes, take place in a space-time. So space-time is a bit like a stage on which all physics is happening. And space-time is a four-dimensional object. This is very important. We're not talking about a three-dimensional space uh, plus absolute time in which physics is happening. Rather, there's a big four-dimensional object in which everything is happening. Uh, the space-time is assumed to be an affine space. Affine space is a very smart way of, of a mathematical way of stating that simply, uh, if we have two points, one a reference point O and another point X, we can assign a vector from O to X. So this is a four-dimensional affine space. The points of the space correspond not to locations, but rather events in space-time. So both they localize the points both in space and in time. Uh, now, the most important 
uh, notion of, of special relativity, I think, is the notion of inertial frame. And it's also, in fact, an, a very important notion of mechanics itself. Uh, you should imagine an inertial frame as an idealized system of clocks and ranging devices uh, whose main purpose is to assign numbers to points or coordinates to points. Uh, an inertial frame is simply a device which lets you um, locate where each of the event happened and assign numbers to, to, to each of these locations uh, in an appropriate way. This must be done, of course, using some kind of clocks, which give you the time, and another measuring device, which gives you the position. And there are many possibilities here. Uh, we will not dive into it. We'll simply go to the mathematical definition. The mathematical definition is that we simply have a reference point O, a reference event, and also four vectors, E0, E1, E2, and E3. And for each point, we can, uh, we can decompose the vector corresponding to this point x uh, into four coordinates, x0, x1, x2, and x3. Uh, now, important, there's an important thing here. Uh, you should keep in mind that uh, the uppercase 0, uh, the, the upper index 0, 1, 2, and 3, uh, in the context of coordinates, does not mean uh, power. It simply means the number of, co of, of coordinates. Uh, so the first coordinate is, is, is denoted as x0, the second one as x1, the third one as x2, and the fourth one as x3. And this is a standard, standard convention here. Uh, the intuition is that E0, this first vector here, corresponds basically to the time flow, and it's related to the motion of our observer. So we assume that this frame is related to a particular uh, observer, which is uh, which we assume to be some kind of physical body, which travels through the space-time somehow. And E0 basically follows this motion. On top of that, we've got three vectors E1, E2, E3, which, we, which define purely spatial directions. Um, they're orthonormal in the sense of standard three-dimensional geometry, and they span a three-dimensional space. The geometry of the space is simply the Euclidean space we know very well and we learn from school. Uh, we assume the frame to be connected to a physical body, which is simply given by x by the condition that x1, x2, and x3 is equal to zero. So that's basically um, the point O um, and how it travels through space-time. Mm, okay. Now, once we are done with the inertial frame, uh, special relativity is basically derived from two assumptions. The first one is called the principle of relativity. Uh, the principle of relativity states that there is more than one inertial frame possible. There's infinitely many of them. However, they're all related to each other by, by a simple relation. Namely, each of them moves with respect to the other one with a constant velocity. So uh if you if you sit in one particular inertial frame and you look at another one you will see that its center is simply moving uh with a constant velocity moreover all of these inertial frames are entirely equivalent from the point of view of mechanics and in fact also other physical laws meaning that if you perform any identical experiments in these two frames uh, you must get the same results uh this is this sounds okay. However, there is an important uh, corollary from that, namely, you cannot detect any kind of absolute velocity of inertial frame without an external reference. So you cannot make any localized experiments which tells you that you are moving with a particular velocity. You need to define another reference frame and measure your velocity with respect to the other reference frame. So there is no absolute motion. Another important point is that the laws of physics, we assume that the laws of physics take a particularly simple form if you write them down in an inertial frame. So obviously, if you if you want to describe motion, you need some kind of coordinates. And if you write them if you write them down in coordinates arising from an inertial frame, they should take a particularly simple form. 
this is not really new. This is also somewhat assumed in Newtonian mechanics, although not always explicitly. Uh, however, what is new is the assumption that the speed of light in vacuum is constant. So it's exactly the value you see here as measured in any inertial frame. This looks innocent, but in fact, there is very serious consequences of this assumption, uh, namely uh, the speed of light. Uh, namely, we need to abandon, abandon many standard intuitions regarding how the space time, time flow and other things work. Uh, basically, we need to abandon this, the standard notion of global absolute time. Um, we have to assume the, that the simultaneity of events is, is a relative thing. We have to accept time duration, uh, Lorentz contraction, and other things we will talk about. So we also have to abandon the notion of frame independent distances between points. Uh, and last but not least, we have to abandon the additivity of velocities. So the standard everyday uh, way, standard everyday experience tells you that uh, if you are moving with velocity of 10 kilometers per hour with respect to, um, to another uh, person, and this person is moving with, with the velocity of 10 kilometers per hour with respect to you in the same direction, then um, that person is moving with relativity of 20 kilometers per hour with respect to the, um, with respect to Earth. Now this does not hold anymore uh, if, we, if we move to special relativity. There'll be corrections to that. Do you have any questions? Okay, I don't hear any, so we can go further. Uh, I will not derive this result, but it's fairly easy to show that under these assumptions, inertial frames must be related to each other by something called Lorentz transformations. Uh, these are basically transformations, uh, linear transformations of, of the vectors EO to E3 given by a matrix. And this matrix has the special property of um, preserving another matrix. So there is a matrix eta, uh, which is a diagonal, but with a minus one on the zero, zero entry and um, equal to plus one on two other entries. We can consider matrices which preserve this eta in the sense that is written above. And then it turns out that the uh, the vectors defining a frame need to be related to each other by this type of multiplication. And below, you can see the relation between the uh, coordinates of a particular vector. So if the coordinates of this vector are given by x nu in, in the cord green coordinate frame without the tilde, then uh, in the tilde one, they will be given by the product lambda mu nu x nu. And if we additionally shift the origin of, the, of our coordinate system of our frame, you also need, you also need to add a, a constant term here. We will not think, we will not talk very much about the um, shifts of, of, of this point of reference. Uh, the first part is more important here. Uh, it's important to realize that these transforms in general mix time and space dimensions. Okay, a very important property of the mm, Lorentz transformations is that they preserve uh, the structure of interval between two events. So imagine we've got events U and W. We consider the vector from W to U, so U minus W minus W, and we call it delta X. It can be uh, obviously decomposed in, in our uh, green frame without tilde as delta X O, E O plus delta X one E one plus delta X two E two plus delta X three E three. We can define the following quantity. Uh, we basically take the squares of each of these components and add the three final ones with a plus and subtract the zero one. Now it turns out that this quantity is exactly equal to the quantity defined using the tilde uh, reference frame. This, uh, this simply follows from the properties of Lorentz transformations. 
Uh, it's more than that. In fact, if we have two vectors, we can define a product of these vectors in the following way. Uh, for the coordinates one, two, and three, we, we take the standard scalar product. So x3, y3 plus x2, y2 plus x1, y1. But for the zero uh, component, we switch the sign to minus. Now it turns out that this product is also conserved, meaning that if you express your vectors x and y in two uh, inertial frames, you'll get different components, but this product will remain the same. Uh, this product can be also written as a sum uh, of x, y with this matrix eta. Uh, it's important to point out that this product has an important is somewhat similar to the standard scalar product you encounter in uh, Euclidean geometry, but it's in, it's different in one important aspect. Namely, it is not positive definite. So if you have a non-zero vector corresponding to two different points U and W, delta S squared, so the product of, of this vector with itself can be positive, but can also be negative and can be zero even if this vector is not zero itself. Okay, I think it's time for break. Um, do you have any questions? Well, actually I have one question uh, yes. regarding previous slide and I think it's not like very good question, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, so, so you said like uh, there is a no way to calculate the velocity of inertial frame if you are in that frame because you will not be able to differentiate it. So then how will we measure that the velocity of frame with that which we are? Because for us, there is no way. Even if we, if, if, even if we are looking outside, uh, how will we know that that object have this absolute velocity zero? Because for us, it will be like moving because we are moving. So, uh, I would not say it has absolute velocity zero. We can measure its velocity with respect to us. So typically when you do measurements, you're sitting in a particular inertial frame. If yeah. you look at other objects, they might be moving with respect to you and you can measure yeah. their velocity, but it'd be a velocity with respect to you. Yeah. If you had another, if you have another person, another researcher who's doing the same measurements, but in a different inertial frame, they will obtain different results and they will be as good as yours, except that they will be different. So the lack of absolute velocity simply means that many people sitting in different uh, inertial frames will obtain different results when they perform certain measurements, but it's not that any of them is right or wrong. All of them are right in their own uh, appropriate frames. So there are velocities, but they're not absolute in that sense. Okay, okay. thank you. I'm going to have okay. one question, can I ask? Yes, sure. Um, so uh, the thing is that when we are talking, so I think it's in the previous slide when we are defining the distances, um so yeah the next one yeah so this one so the point is that um in three-dimensional space it is still easy to understand the distances uh, when we are measuring from point a to point b but let's say if we just go into space time uh mm -hmm. of one dimensional of space and one dimension of time so, yes uh, and in that scenario uh, when we are making these plots uh at that time how are those distances, like how can I imagine those distances intuitively? So I will talk about it in 10 slides more or less, I think. Ah, okay. But the short answer is that mm -hmm. depending on their sign, they have a slightly different interpretation. Mm -hmm. But yes, I can yeah, tell yeah, you yeah, now, okay. I can tell you right now. Oh, okay. If this distance, mm -hmm. if this delta is square, okay, mm -hmm. the square here is a bit of a misnomer. This, is, this does mm -hmm. not have to be a positive quantity. If mm -hmm. it's negative, mm -hmm. then the square root of minus of that mm -hmm. is basically the time Mm -hmm. uh, 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 is the time lapse between W and U? Yes. In appropriate frame, such that the 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 center of this frame or the the reference body passes through W and U. So, mm -hmm. if if this quantity is negative, then you can construct a frame which uh, um, which the center of frame passes through W and then through U, mm -hmm. and you can measure the time which passes from which. Uh, it takes for, for for the body to get from w mm -hmm. to u and this mm -hmm. this time will be the square root of minus delta s squared mm -hmm. uh, if this is a positive quantity mm -hmm. then you can on, then you can find a, a special reference frame in which mm -hmm. um, u and w happen simultaneously mm -hmm. in that case you can measure the 
spatial distance between these these mm -hmm. two points uh, in this particular frame, and this will be the square root of delta square without a minus this time. Mm -hmm. And okay. if it is equal to zero, then this is a bit more complicated, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So it, it tells you a lot about the the relation, because our relations and uh, relation between these two events, but that's a little bit more complicated. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I will stop sharing screen and let's meet in 15 minutes. Okay, I will not close the meeting. I will just stop recording. Okay, so we can start the second uh, part of our lecture. Uh, we'll go on with the slides. Let me share my screen. Yes, so we were discussing the special relativity and Lorentz transforms. Uh, Lorentz transforms are transforms which take you from one inertial frame to another one, and they're defined by a set of matrices, a matrices which have the property of um, satisfying the equation you see over here. The transpose of lambda times eta times lambda is supposed to be equal to eta, where eta is a special matrix which is diagonal and has minus one entry in the beginning and plus one entries at the very end. Um, yes, we have also, yeah, please go, go on, go on. Yeah. So, uh, so I question. just wanted to ask that, uh, when we are talking about Lorentz transformation, it yes. is a direct, uh, consequence of having, uh, uh the, uh, like, it's not just the speed of light, but it's also, uh, the Maxwell's equation to be consistent with in SR, right? Uh, I think you don't need the full Maxwell's equations for that. I think the consist that the constancy of light, speed of light is enough. So I think there's a nice derivation in either in Schutz's book, textbook, or in Hartle's textbook. And I think all mm -hmm. that you need is just this constancy of the speed of light. Yes, uh, I understand. But I'm saying that is this constancy of speed of light coming as a consequence of Maxwell's equation to be consistent in SR? Or is uh, yes. it yeah. Uh, in a sense, yes, you can look at it this way, but okay. then you have to assume that the Maxwell's equation have the same form in every uh, exactly. inertial frame. And that was not very clear to mathematicians and physicists uh, mm -hmm. in the late 19th century that it is so. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So in that sense, it is true. Uh, the speed of light follows from the Maxwell's equations. Mm -hmm. But what was not clear was that the Maxwell's equations have the same form when you change the uh, inertial frame. In fact, they do, uh, but not in a very trivial way. You have to transform the electric and magnetic field in an appropriate way. But if you do it, they do. And indeed, the constancy of the speed of light follows from that. Mm -hmm. However, the textbooks I know typically just assume the, the constancy of the speed of light and yes. don't go all the way to Maxwell's equations, partially because they are more complicated algebraically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like I, uh, I, I asked this question like, when the Lorentz transformation were developed by Lorentz, I think so, he might have considered the, not the speed of light to be constant, but the Maxwell's equation to be consistent. Mm -hmm. and from there, a consequence was that the speed of light became constant and uh, in, in any given frame of reference. So I believe it is possible to go this in this direction, but you can just think about the constancy of speed of light, that there is mm -hmm. a preferred speed in the universe Mm -hmm. uh, which is supposed to be preserved by all uh, inertial frames. And this should be enough to, uh, to do, this should be absolutely enough mm -hmm. to uh, show that this has to be satisfied, mm -hmm. that, that, that you need to use matrices of this kind. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so the next slide is a little bit of a comparison between special relativity and Newtonian physics without much derivation, just, just to show you what is going on. So on the left-hand side, you've got the, um, you've got the space time. Uh, now, when, uh, when I try to, to show you something in, on, on a two-dimensional screen, I have to suppress two dimensions. So here we are not looking at a fully four-dimensional space time. We're looking at a space time with dimension one plus one spatial ones, spatial one. So you should imagine that there is two additional ones here, which we don't see. Uh, so you can see that 
uh, we have two frames here. One of them is, is, is the uh, black one. Uh, what you see here is two axes corresponding, X corresponding to the spatial dimension and CT corresponding to time. And you see these dotted lines corresponding to constant time foliation. So uh, these are sets of events, which according to the uh, observer at, for, in frame, uh, in, in the black frame, um, happen exactly at the same moment. According, at least in, in his or her initial frame. But then we've got another frame, this, this violet magenta one, uh, denoted by a tilde. Uh, it is related to the previous one by Lorentz transform, whose form you can see uh, here below. Now, the interesting thing that happens is that uh, the planes of simultaneity or the sets of events, which according to the uh, second frame are simultaneous is not the same one. So these two frames, so observers at these two frames will, would not exist, uh, would not agree on which of the two events happen exactly at the same time and which don't. And this is very important. And this is very much unlike the uh, space-time of Newtonian physics or the, the Galilean space-time. You can still define something like uh, the the um, counterpart of of uh, Lorentz transforms, so-called Galilean transforms, they're written below here. You simply time here doesn't change very much, and the the, the position changes because of the motion of of the um, tilde frame. However, in, in Newtonian physics, both of these frames agree uh, which of the uh, which of the events in this space time happen exactly at the same time. So you can you can consider the, the flow of time in the Newtonian physics as something absolute independent of, of frame. And obviously in special relativity you cannot. And that makes quite a big of a quite a big difference. Okay. Uh, any questions? I don't hear any, so let's go to the next uh, next slide. Uh, so there is many very many different Lorentz transforms possible, but a very important group are transforms which we call boosts. We imagine we've got one frame and another frame which moves with respect to this previous one uh, with a constant velocity, and we imagine that our uh, uh, that the other frame is 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 basically related to this one by uh, by by the simplest transform possible. Uh, the simplest transform possible is is, is called a boost. Uh, it has this somewhat unpleasant form. At first, it looks rather unpleasant. Uh, gamma is an important quantity, and I, I would like you to remember it. It's equal to one minus square root of one minus velocity of 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 the tilted frame with respect to the uh, non-tilde non one uh, squared divided by c squared. Uh, yes, and you can see here that we that it looks pretty much like the Lorentz transform we have seen on the previous screen. But here we do not assume that the velocity is aligned with, with uh, the axis x. So, um, so we've got the product of v and x here on the top here. And on the bottom side, we have to, uh, we've got an equation in which the transformation acts a bit differently on the direction uh, perpendicular to the direction of motion. This is this x perpendicular and a bit differently uh, on the direction along the, uh, along the direction of motion. That's x with, uh, uh, x with, with two, two lines. Uh, it is also possible to write an inverse relation. So given uh, coordinates in the tilde frame, you ask about the coordinates in the, in the black frame. Uh, it turns out that it's enough to switch the sign of the uh, velocity vector to get the appropriate transform here. Okay. Now it's time to talk a little bit more about certain conventions whose uh, main purpose is to simplify our lives. Uh, so in most relativity, special relativity textbooks, uh, 
we prefer not to deal with the speed of light um, directly. We rather introduced a new uh, new time coordinate, which is equal to c times the old time coordinate, and measure the uh, and this way we measure time in meters. Uh, exactly the same way we measure time, we, we measure distance. Uh, the problem is that in special relativity, we try to treat time and space more or less at the same footing, but historically we use very different measurement units for them. But they're naturally related by the speed of light, which in special relativity is a privileged speed. So it seems like a good idea to introduce a new time coordinate, which is consistent with the uh, spatial unit of, of, of spatial distance equal to C times the uh, standard time coordinate. So now the time is measured in meters. One meter is very short time, it's simply the time it takes light to, to, to pass, um, uh, to move by a meter. In this new convention, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, so uh, uh, we used in, uh, in special relativity, we used the time, uh, time as a CT uh, because uh, two dimensionally correct uh, with the, the spatial coordinates. Uh, so CT means, uh, and also uh, the spatial coordinates, the units are consistent. So uh, is that the reason we used CT? Uh, multiple, uh, time coordinate is multiplied by velocity of light. Is that the reason? Yes, that's the reason. It simplifies a lot of calculations, as you will see. So purpose number one is to somehow simplify complicated formulas. Uh, if you write them in standard coordinates, there will be a lot of sp speeds of light uh, and their powers appearing in, in many places in, in, in formulas, but it turns out that this is not really necessary if you just adjust your time coordinate. Or in principle, you could also adjust the uh, spatial uh, the unit of, 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 of space or distances, then you can get rid of that entirely. So and why, uh, so my uh, my question is, so why uh, speed of light? Why don't we use uh, any other velocity as so just simply uh, any other velocity? Why it's it a historical reason or is any uh, No, no, it's because the speed of light is sort of built into the special relativity itself. So recall that one of the postulates of special relativity is that uh, the speed of light in vacuum is constant. So there is a special privilege velocity equal to the speed of light, which has a curious uh, property of being the same in whatever frame you, you, you look at that. If you see something uh, moving with the speed C uh, in, your, in your inertial frame, then everybody else will also see exactly the same speed. But this, is on, this works only for this particular speed and not for any others. So there is a privileged speed built into the uh, special relativity itself. There is no scale of the, there is no distance scale, but there is a privileged uh, velocity, uh, and we want to use this privileged velocity. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so one nice side, one positive side of, of 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 introducing new time coordinates is that we've got a uh, new type of velocity, which is basically the old velocity divided by c, and this is a dimensionless thing. So instead of giving the velocity in meters per second or kilometers per hour or whatever else, uh, we can give it as numbers measuring the, the ratio of the velocity to the speed of light. Uh, that's the dimensionless velocity. And of course, in this new coordinates, the speed of light simply corresponds to one. And that's what we want to achieve. This way, we, simply, we will simplify a lot of calculations, as you will see. Uh, and it's important to remember that it's relatively easy to go back to the standard uh, world with standard units of measurement. You just have to replace consistently new time with the old time, uh, multiplying by appropriate power of c. Uh, you have to replace the new velocity with the old velocity, and so on. We will do. We will see examples during this lecture. Okay. Then Einstein summation convention. So. Uh, this is something that looks at first a little funny and, 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 and stupid, but in fact, it's extremely useful. It's one of those small inventions that made uh, makes physics much, much simpler. The Einstein summation convention. So here it is. Imagine we've, we have an expression where we have one object with an in lowered index mu and another object with a higher index mu. 
the convention is that we read this not as a product, but as a sum of products over all possible values of mu. Uh, now this convention assumes that we have some additional convention regarding where the, where we, which, what values the indices usually take. The most common convention is that the Greek indices are space-time indices, they take values zero, one, two, and three. So A mu B mu is sum over all possible mu values of mu. So from zero to three of A mu B mu. So it's A zero B zero plus A one B one plus A two B two plus A three B three. Now that we have, that we managed to spare a lot of space uh, by forgetting the sum sign. So basically, this is a convention that we forget the sum signs when we have one index appearing uh, in the same product, both uh, as a lower index and the higher index. Uh, and we we don't apply it only to one possible index. Look at the expression here below. Uh, C has two indices, uh, two lower indices, and the, and we have the product with D with an upper mu index and E with a upper new index. And now we understand that as a double summation, we sum over mu and sum over new, again, over their uh, normal range from zero to three. Uh, and note that there is no difference uh, in which order we take this summation. Uh, in the end, it amounts to the same thing. It's just this thing here is simply uh, a sum over all possible pairs uh, of, of index values, zero, one, two, and three, assigned to each of them. Uh, and we have to uh, appropriately uh, appropriately um, substitute mu with an appropriate index 0, 1, or 3, and, and also mu, and sum over all possibilities. Uh, is this clear? Um, yes. Professor, this is also uh, um, like convention with respect to the matrices, right? Uh, yes and no. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use it with matrices as well, but we'll use it in tensor calculus, which is a little bit different than, than the matrices you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. We'll see it in later later lectures. Okay. I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same page and we all mm -hmm. understand this, this convention. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I'm not, not telling you exactly what A and B are. Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, stating that whenever you see an index Whenever you see a, a term, which is a product of smaller terms, and in this term you see uh, the same index uh, as a lower index and an upper index, you should understand that there is a summation. Just, just one thing I wanted to ask. Like, so, for example, like uh, we are going to learn more about these indices and uh, these expressions in further lectures, right? Yes. Ah, okay, thank you. Yes, this is a very important part of relativity. Uh, because a lot of differential geometry actually relies on this on, on, on this uh, notation, and I think it's quite important to to, to master it. Uh, okay. Now note something very interesting. It doesn't really matter how we call this index we sum over. So when we have a mu b mu with mu lower and upper, we could equally well write a alpha b upper alpha or a lower gamma b upper gamma or whatever else whatever greek letter you, you is your favorite one all of them mean the same thing they mean that you sum over this index uh, these indices are, are are called dummy indices or summation indices uh, there are place there's simply an indication that there is a summation going between these 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 two indices but the name the label doesn't mean anything in the end, what we mean here is just the sum of a0, b0 plus a1, b1 plus a2, b2 plus a3, b3. And that's an important point. Very often in algebraic calculations, uh, you change the name of the summation index, index in order to achieve something. And you will see this uh, appearing more and more in, uh, in the exercise classes. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, look at the second formula. Here we've got a lower mu, up, b upper mu. This is exactly the same as b upper mu, a lower mu, right? Because we mean here uh, simply the summation uh, and the change, change of ordering between a and b simply means that you change the ordering of, of product in each of these, of these terms, a0, b0, and so on, and so on. 
but multiplication is uh, of course uh, commutative, so you can you can, you can switch the order. Uh, you can also you can also play the same game when you have double summation or some or summation of of other type. So you can have C uh, lower mu nu D upper mu E upper nu. This is the same as C lower mu nu E upper nu D lower mu, and this is same as D upper mu E upper nu uh, C lower mu nu, right? And there is also many other ways, but this is important. Keep in mind that in all of these examples, uh, we haven't changed the uh, the ordering of the indices. So it is still the index related to D, which is the first index in C, and it is the index related to E that is new, uh, which is then summed with the second index of C. This is this is all true in this in this upper row here. Now look what happens in the in the lower row here. But here we have C mu nu, the upper new E upper new. So the index mu, the index related to D is summed over the first index of C. The index related to new is, is summed with the second index of C. And on the other side, I keep the order of C, D, and E, but I change the indices. So, so now the first index of C, which is mu, is uh, summed over with E. And the second index is, uh, is summed with D. Now, this is not the same expression as the one on the left-hand side. Uh, can you see why? Well, the index of D has changed, right? Sorry? The index of D has changed. Yes, exactly. So, so uh, if, you, if you simply write it, you, you can do it as an exercise back home. You, you, you just write explicitly what this corresponds to, and you'll see that this will correspond to not only a change of order of, of terms which you sum over, but these terms will be simply different. Okay, uh, another thing, dummy indices versus free indices. So in the future, we'll see many expressions of the following kind. Um, we've got an object, let's say x tilde mu, and this is supposed to be equal to another object. This is lambda upper mu, lower mu x mu. So there's two indices here. However, keep in mind that their role is very different. The index mu, which which is marked in blue, is a free index. It links the expressions on the left hand side of the equations with the right hand side of the equations, and simply tells you that this is a shorthand notation for four different equations. The one you get by uh, plugging in mu equal to zero, another one you get by plugging mu equal to one, and yet another by plugging mu equal to two, and yet another by uh, plugging mu equal to three. So there's four equations written as one. On the other hand, this orange index, nu, is a dummy index. It's an index we sum over. It appears in every uh, equation here. And in order to go, go back to the simplest, to, 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 to the long form of this equation, you would have to explicitly write down the summation. Now, dummy indices or summation indices are quite different from the free indices. Uh, when you write an expression, you have to make sure that the indices on the, of the left-hand side match the ones on the free indices of the left-hand left side match the free indices of the right-hand side. But you don't, don't need to do it with the summation indices because they're summed over. They're just uh, an indication that you will, in the end, you also have to do a summation. However, what you need to make sure is that uh, you use different letters for different kinds of indices. So if you use mu as your, as your uh, free index, you should not use mu as a summation index as well, because this creates a very ambiguous uh, expression. Uh, and one more remark. Uh, we do not define, we do not consider expressions like A with two lower mu indices, A lower mu, B lower mu, C upper sigma, D upper sigma. Uh, we do not understand any summation by that. We, we simply don't give give this type of expression any special meaning. This does not mean any summation. Uh, it's not clear, I guess, why this is the case at the moment. But later you will see that it's actually this this convention is actually pretty clever. It it helps you to avoid certain ambiguities. 
And we also don't define what happens when you see when we see the index alpha in one expression uh, more than twice. So you you have a lower alpha, b upper alpha, c again lower alpha. We do not understand this as summation. This is something undefined. We do not try to assign any meaning to that. Again, there is a good reason for that. It's like in programming computer languages. It's better to consider some expressions illegal because they're ambiguous and they can create a lot of confusion. So we consider these expressions ambiguous and undefined. Okay. Uh, any questions to that? This, that? That was an important slide. Uh, no, I don't hear any. So let's go to the next one. Uh, yeah, so here you can see uh, we have got rid of, of C, of the speed of light. It's now equal to one in our new uh, measurement system. And now we can write down our uh, expression for uh, general boosts uh, with velocity V in a slightly simpler form. So gamma is now simply one minus one minus V squared. V is what, what used to be V over C. Uh, and also the expression for the Lorentz boost itself simplifies a little bit. Uh, there's again no speeds of light running around uh, and making the expressions a bit complicated. Okay. Now we go to another important topic, the kinematics in special relativity. Kinematics is the study of motion. So we will talk a little bit more how we describe motion in special relativity. This is important because as you will see, describing motion in general relativity is quite related to that. So we begin by massive particles, like, I don't know, mm, neutrons, protons, or ordinary objects. Uh, they are described by word lines. By word lines, I simply mean curves in, in the space time. By curves, I mean parameterized curves. So we give a, an external parameter, uh, which takes values from some value to another one. And x mu of lambda simply tells you which points of the space time in a particular frame uh, the particle has traveled through uh, for a particular lambda. Uh, there is many parameterizations possible. The simplest choice and the one you would be very much inclined to, to use in Newtonian physics would be to use the coordinate time. So we are in a particular frame. This frame defines a coordinate time x0. And we can try to use this x0 as our parameter. In that case, this curve x mu of lambda looks quite simple. You, you will get x0 as the first coordinate, the parameter. X0 here is a bit tricky because it's at the same time the parameter of this curve and at the same time the, the external coordinate, but sorry for that. And then we have X1, X2, and X3 of X0, which is the, the, the coordinate uh, time uh, defining the motion. We can now calculate the velocity by differentiating the position this x mu vector would ex expect to x0. We always get one for the first coordinate and the rest is simply the spatial velocity of, of our body. Uh, now, it is assumed in, in special relativity that massive particles uh, travel with speeds smaller than the speed of light. And it's fairly easy to show that if this is the case, so V, the, the modulus of V is smaller than one, recall that our speed of light is now one. Then uh, this vector dx mu over dx zero uh, multiplied by itself. So a time you knew this times this, this has to be negative. That's an important point. Okay. For a massive particle, you can always find something called the momentarily commoving frame. What is that? Well, this is a frame in which at a given moment, at a given instant of time, our body appears to be not moving at all. Now, since the body may be accelerating, this will not be consistently the same frame, but at least at every moment you can find one. Uh, this is here denoted by this blue, mm, blue color. Again, I suppressed the dimensions x1 and x2 because it's just the screen is only two dimensional. Uh, so we find a special frame in which at this very moment, our body is passing through the center of the frame 
and it seems to be at rest, at least at this moment. So we denote this frame as E tilde, and we'd like to see what this E tilde looks like. Uh, now, E0 is supposed to be uh, co-moving with our body, so it's, it has to be somehow related to this velocity vector 1 vi. Uh, however, it's, it is also assumed in, in, in the Lorentz transformations, mm, I might have forgot to tell you about, uh, E0 has to be normalized uh, to minus 1. So the product of E0 by itself is supposed to be minus 1. It means we have to rescale this uh, vector E0. And if you do simple maths, you can easily show that this rescaling thing is actually gamma, 1 over 1 square root 1 minus v squared, where v is the total velocity here. Uh, now, this vector, uh, this zero vector of the, of the co-moving frame, has a special name. It's called the four velocity of a given body. And in an external frame, it simply has the uh, components of gamma and gamma vi. Uh, OK. Now, what is this four velocity, really? Uh, that's, that is a vector which is always normalized. So if you calculate the product of u by itself, it has to be minus 1. We assume that it's also future pointing. So it's pointing towards positive growing values of x0, which corresponds to the future. And as we mentioned, in any co-moving frame, uh, the 0, the, 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 the time component of the frame is exactly equal to u. In fact, uh, you can use these uh, conditions to define the four velocity. Okay, sir, I have a question. Yes. Can you uh, please just make me understand this co-moving frame? Like, is it like for a given moment, or this frame moves with the particles? Like, because... uh, it's it moves with the particle, and if the particle is moving with a constant velocity, then it's basically forever. Yeah. But we can also assume that the particle is accelerating, and in that case, it will uh, be a function of uh, then time. coordinates, right? Yes, of course, it will be a, a, a function of time. At each time, we will have a slightly different frame. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, but what is absolutely certain that is that at each time, you will find at least one frame of this kind. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, in any co-moving frame, the E0 at the moment is equal to U. There is now another very important notion uh, deeply connected with the power velocity is the notion of proper time. Basically, uh, oh yes, Mr. Biswas, please. Uh, so, Professor, can you go one slide back? Just yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, so in this slide, you said yes. that, okay, E0 is like the four velocity yes. that we are having. Yes. But then what does E1 represent? Uh, E1, okay, in that case, you, we could in principle write a, a, a formula for that. In this case, it would be simply gamma vi on the up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, imagine we are just in two dimensions. There is no dimensions mm -hmm. two and three. Yes. In this case, this yes. is gamma and gamma v, and, and there is v. no two three dimensions. Yeah. And, and the one would be gamma v gamma. Mm -hmm. However, it's not all that important. Uh, in case of co-moving frame, we are only interested really in this easier thing. Mm -hmm. Because look, if you have a frame, you can always rotate your spatial, uh, yes. spatial vectors, one yes. to E3. Yes. Now you can't do it in two dimensions and this E1 is sort of aligned with the only possible uh, mm -hmm. spatial vector. Mm -hmm. But in three dimensions, we, we don't assume any alignment and actually we don't very much care where this E1, E2 and E3 mm -hmm. are pointing. We only care about the fact that E0, which defines the flow of time, mm -hmm. agrees exactly with the with the motion of of our particle. particle. Yeah, because like these E0 and E1 are not unit vectors with respect to that uh, with respect to the co-moving frame of reference, right? These are velocity vectors which are there. Uh, there are unit. There are unit in the sense that that the product in the sense of this metric eta is mm -hmm. equal to minus one for E0 and plus one mm -hmm. for E1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that is what I'm saying. Like they are not exactly the unit vectors; they are like the velocity vectors which are defining. Uh, defining uh, 
excuse me, no, they are unit vectors. E0 is a unit vector. It's not written here. Um, sorry. Um, okay. It's it's not spatial vectors, right? These are all no. uh, velocity vectors. Okay, let me let me do it a bit differently. I also have a blackboard here. Mm -hmm. So let's let me make a bit of a blackboard lecture now. So basically the vectors E0, E1, and E3, E2, E3, define our frame. We assume that they are normalized in the following sense. In the sense of this metric eta, yes. this is normalized to zero, this is normalized to one. Mm -hmm. So the spatial are normalized in the sense, standard sense of being normalized, mm -hmm. but the zero one is normalized to minus one. And mm -hmm. on top of that, the products of, of these vectors is equal to zero, zero if i is not equal to j. Mm -hmm. yes. So this is in a sense, an orthonormal frame. Mm -hmm. So EO constitutes an orthonormal frame, but in a strange sense, orthonormal in the sense of this metric eta which has minus one instead of one yes. here. And the same goes for any frame. So also for, for this tilde frame. So when we find a commoving frame, we've got a, uh, we've got a particle moving here. Mm -hmm. uh, and at a given moment, we look for the vector E tilde zero, such that E tilde zero is tangent to this curve mm -hmm. in the standard sense. Basically, E0 mu is proportional to dx mu over d lambda. And we also assume that it is normalized properly. Mm -hmm. yes. And from that, we get the expression for E0 I have, mm -hmm. I have shown you before. That mm -hmm. E0 is gamma gamma vi. So gamma contains information about the velocity of the object mm -hmm. uh, in a given frame, but it is the spatial part which contains this information about the velocity. The spatial part is basically vi divided by square root one over minus v squared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, because uh, what, what I was saying is that x mu, and let's say in this E0 frame of reference, we mm -hmm. have x prime mu uh, as our uh, like uh, coordinates, then yes. uh, X prime mu uh, will be very much different with respect to E zero prime, right? Like yes. So so, uh -huh. so if you try to write this this equation uh, mm -hmm. in the primed mm -hmm. uh, reference frame, you simply get one zero zero. Exactly. exactly. Yes. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes. yes exactly. Mm -hmm. That's another way to think about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's exactly stating that. Uh, that's a different way of stating that E0 is tangent to X mu at this particular mm -hmm. moment. Simply mm -hmm. means that this uh, tangent vector here, uh, uh, okay, and th th there might be a constant here because yeah. lambda, lambda is a parameter we mm -hmm. don't control at the moment, but yes. we'll get to that. Yeah. So in that okay. sense, I, ab I absolutely agree. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, well, let's go back here. Okay. Once we are done with four velocity, there is another important notion I would like to talk about today. This is the proper time. And the, the intuition behind the proper time is that this is the time uh, along the word line of this geodesic as measured by a perfect clock commoving with this observer. So we assume that this observer is a spaceship and has a very precise atomic clock. Uh, this atomic clock has a ticking rate which very much agrees with the ticking rate of the uh, of the clock defining the commoving frame at, at a given moment. However, it does not react in any way to accelerations of our, our um, body here. It only uh, It is only sensitive to its velocity in the sense that its ticking rate agree, agrees with the ticking rate of a clock of a commoving frame. So the flow of the proper time matches the coordinate time of the commoving frame at a given moment. Uh, I hope this definition is clear. So we would like to see what this detail looks like. Um, 
so d tau is nothing else but a small variation of the coordinate time, but in, in, in a co-moving coordinate, uh, a co-moving frame. So yeah, there is this co-moving frame over here. And in this frame, we now write this equation here. d tau is just this dx zero. Uh, we also know that e tilde zero is related to, to the velocity in this external frame. We're looking at, at this thing. Um, by this equation over here. This is the equation for the inverse Lorentz transform between the, uh, the this external for this, this black frame and the and the co-moving frame. Uh, since the body is is not moving in this tilde frame at all, there is no variation of the position x x tilde variation. So the variation of x zero is just the variation of the uh, coordinate time x zero. Uh, which simply means that dx0, the uh, variation of the coordinate time uh, of the frame, of this external frame, is equal to gamma times the variation of the proper time. Uh, or in other words, the very d tau, the, the, the small unit of change of the proper time, is just gamma to minus one of the variation of the external coordinate time. And from that, we can integrate this formula. The proper time of defined in, in, for example, in terms of the coordinate time is equal to some kind of external reference plus an integral from some t0 to x0 of the square root of one minus v squared dt. Now, this is an important notion. Uh, here it is written in, in, in a particular coordinate, external coordinate frame and at which we are describing this whole situation. But in fact, proper time is defined uh, intrinsically. Uh, if we try to introduce, uh, if we introduce a different frame uh, boosted with respect to the black one and repeat this calculation, uh, it turns out that we would get exactly the same uh, notion of proper time. So this is something defined, proper time is defined intrinsically just by the motion of the body. Uh, in practice, in order to calculate the, the, the flow of the proper time, you probably introduce a coordinate system related to an inertial frame and perform these calculations, but it doesn't matter which of them you use, you must end up with the same result. So tau is not a property of the uh, frame at which we're looking at the motion of particle, it's just the property of the motion of the particle itself. Um, was it clear? Any questions? Probably none. Now we can introduce the proper time as a kind of intrinsically defined parameter for a massive particle. So we have x mu of tau. And if we differentiate x mu with respect to tau, it's easy to see that what we get is what we already know, the four velocity. So another way to think about the four velocity is that it is the uh, derivative of, of position with respect to parameter, where this parameter is this a proper time measured by the local atomic clock. Uh, however, this is, this definition is, is kind of harder to use, uh, a bit more implicit, and I thought that the previous one would be a bit more interesting. Okay, I think I think this is enough for today because it's already 10.59. Uh, any questions to the lecture? Well, I have this one. Yes, because we are already moving with respect to the uh, like over here. I can see these are not like the time dilation parameters, right? Uh, but sorry, these are the time dilation parameters, right? Uh, so what is happening here? Uh, I, I don't think I understand your question. What is happening no, here I, is that I yes. think so. Right now, like the derivation is for time dilation with respect to another frame of reference, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to be uh, in yes? The next so, part? so, so. Uh, here's how it works. So we've got an external black uh, inertial frame in which we describe this whole situation. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we have what we introduced before, uh, the momentary co-moving frame, mm -hmm. which is the one with, with, with tilde. Uh, we know that the proper time is related to the coordinate time in this tilde frame. So we look for mm -hmm. the relation between the coordinate time of the external frame, mm -hmm. this black one, and the one which is co-moving. This is exactly what this calculation is about. Because if we if we find the variation of the uh, coordinate time along this curve 
um, then this will be simply the variation of the of the proper time. Yeah, so I think so. I have um, like didn't say the question correctly. So the point is that um, in later part of the lectures, will we have um, time dilation parameter and length contraction parameter also? Yes. Yes, we will, we will, yes, we will talk about Lorentz contraction and time yes. dilation as well. Yes. But we'll probably, probably in one of the classes, I guess, mm -hmm. because that's that's something more for the classes than for the lecture itself, I believe. But yes, okay. I plan to I plan to talk about it as well. Of course, yes. Okay. Okay. Then I'll ask the question at that time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Going back to Zoom. Uh, okay, yeah, I, so, have, I have yes. a question. If I can ask. Yes, sure. Uh, uh, regarding co-moving, so uh, so this co-moving is this the frame which is uh, on the particle which is moving, right? Yes. So so I'm thinking like does not like this particle have only time component because so then e one component should be zero, right? Like because if I'm on the on the frame of particle, so for me this this position become fixed that it will have only time component right but yes, I'm not sure yes. If you completely so I, I assume the following things i assume that we, we we fix a point on this green curve corresponding to the motion of the particle that's the blue point over here mm -hmm. uh, this point will be the center of will be the point of reference of my frame so at the moment at, at that moment this particle has x tilde mu equal to zero because simply we are Mm, right at, at the center. And now I also assume that this uh, frame is coming. Sorry to interrupt. The yes. thing is your screen sharing is off. Oh, sorry. I should. <laughs> I forgot. Sorry, I forgot about it. Yes, let me do the screen sharing. Uh, yeah, it should be here now. Now we are back. Okay. So here is what is happening. Uh, we've got our the word line of our particle in motion, we pick up a moment. This is the blue dot over here. Can you see everything? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. So we have this blue dot, which corresponds to choosing a particular moment on, uh, during the motion of this particle. Uh, so we know that at the in, in this co-moving frame, uh, at this particular moment, the particles exactly in the in the in the point of the, the the center of the of the frame itself. So its position is equal to zero. However, the co-moving being co-moving is defined rather in terms of of, of motion, in, in terms of uh, what is going to happen in, in in the next moment. What happens when we have an infinitesimal lapse of time? Now the assumption is that uh, if we wait for an infinitesimal amount of time. In the co-moving frame, our particle will remain at rest, at rest. It will not change its position by definition. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So I think now I understand it. And the mathematical way of stating that is, is the following. I assume that uh, the, zero comp the zero vector corresponding to this frame uh, is proportional to the tangent vector to this green curve here. The tangent vector is what we call one v one v two v three, so our e zero has to be proportional to one v i, and then I have to impose the normalization condition e zero times e zero is minus one. So I introduced here the notation with 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 um, summing over over mu indices, by the way, as as a product, and here c. Uh, you can show that from from this fact c has to be equal to gamma, and I've got the the. So, so if I assume e zero to be this, uh, my vector u will be tangent to my curve, and in this particular frame, at this particular moment, the particle will appear at last. In a short period of time, it will not change its position, yeah, yeah. and that's all that is to it. Yes, thank you. Okay, I think it's already time. Uh, the time is up. Thank you very much for for participating at this lecture. Uh, if you haven't sent an email to me um, personally, please do it now because I would prefer to have everybody's. E I would prefer to be sure I have everybody's email in my uh, email address in order to avoid any problems we had today. Um, and if any of your friends wanted to join this lecture but did not find the link, please tell them that the recording of this lecture will be available, so they haven't missed all that much. 
and I welcome them on the next lecture.